Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Geneviève Zabriskie. I'm director of CREES, the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies. Um, we're very excited to, to have Laura Henry uh, this afternoon with us, who will be discussing um, extraction and equity, indigenous communities and oil companies in the Russian Arctic. And this is part of our lecture series on the environment. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had Zhuzha Gila from uh, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana talking about trash and waste um, in Central Europe. Uh, we have Laura today. Um, next semester, we'll have also Gabriela Corona uh, for CES, who's going to be talking about eco-mafias in Italy. So we're trying to put together different uh, topics related to the environment throughout the year for all centers of the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. Um, Laura Henry is professor in the Department of Government and Legal Studies at Bowdoin College in Maine. So we're very grateful that she made the trek <laughs> from Maine to be uh, with us today. Her research investigates Russia's post-Soviet transformation, focusing on state-society relations, environmental politics, extractive industries, and interaction of transnational and local actors. Henry's current work compares how Russian NGOs engage in global governments institutions with their counterparts in China, Brazil, India, and South Africa. She's the author of Red to Green, Environmental Activism in Post-Soviet Russia, published with Cornell University Press in 2010, and she's the co-editor of Russian Civil Society, a Critical Assessment, published in 2006. Her work has appeared in, in environmental politics, global environmental politics, post-Soviet <coughs> affairs, Europe-Asia studies, and other journals. She's been a Watson Foundation Fellow and a Fulbright Scholar. Her research has received support from the National Security Education Program, the Social Science Research Council, and uh, IREX, the International Research and Exchange Board. Um, please join me in welcoming Laura here this afternoon. <clears throat> well, thank you so much. Thank you, jean for inviting me. I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to make sure my microphone is on. I believe it's on now. Yes? Okay, good. I'm not very technologically savvy. Well, I'm so happy to be here. I, um, I visited um, before just to hear some talks and visit some faculty here about eight years ago. It's wonderful to see you in this new space and um, to see the vibrant group of scholars you've <coughs> pulled together. So as jean have said, I'm going to talk a little bit about extraction and equity in the indigenous communities of the Russian Arctic. And I wanted to give you a little background on this topic. I came to it through my work uh, on environmental politics, actually first working in forest communities um, and looking at Forest Stewardship Council certification in those communities. And this is a project that I have been working on since 2012 with my colleague Maria Tisachnyuk, who is an environmental sociologist based at the Center for Independent Social Research in St. Petersburg. So um, I have to give her a lot of the credit. We designed the project and carried out the initial field work together. And Maria has been a champ going back into the field over and over again. And we also have a graduate student, Svetlana Tulayeva, who's helped us as well. And she now is a professor at a university in St. Petersburg. So I'm grateful to both of them. And I have to give Maria special credit for the images that I, did, that I haven't marked. Otherwise, they are Maria's. She's a much better photographer than I am. And she generously uh, let me use her, her images. So this project is ongoing. I'm going to tell you about kind of the early phases of it. But I do absolutely welcome your feedback as we, as we go through the talk. OK. Uh, there we go. So as many of you know, there's a significant overlap between the areas in which oil and gas are extracted in Russia and the areas where indigenous peoples live. So if you look at this map, you can, oops, and I just turned it off. There we go. That's not what I meant to do. If you look at this map and you see this area in particular um, in the Yamalinenets region, in the Russian Arctic, and then the Sakhalin region over here in the Sea of Japan, um, you can see that those are some of the areas where we also see oil extraction going on, right? So we have this coincidence of the areas where indigenous peoples are and where oil extraction is occurring. I'll go back to that last slide. 
Oop, there we go. Okay, so this, of course, coincidence creates a variety of problems. It's not easy to extract hydrocarbons from the ground without doing some damage to the territory. And these are areas where many indigenous peoples continue to practice traditional livelihoods. So for example, reindeer herding, hunting, fishing, foraging, and other activities. And extractive industries have created challenges both with water contamination and soil contamination through oil spills, soil and plant destruction through construction and building and transportation, air quality issues with gas flaring, and other forms of waste and disruption. Now these environmental impacts are actually fairly visible on the landscape, but what is less visible is the social and economic uh, impacts of extraction in the longer term. And so I wanna talk about both of those things today. So when we went into the field, we wanted to see how do local communities engage with oil and gas companies over issues of environmental degradation and um, the well-being of communities. And we expected the, play to, the, the state to play a major role in this process, and in fact it does. Those of you who study Russia will not be surprised, but not exactly in the way that we expected. And we were surprised to find that many of our interlocutors in the local communities talked much more about the corporation, the oil and gas company, than the state. So today we want to think a little bit about why that would be and what that means for grassroots mobilization in Russia. Okay, so these are my research questions. So what we discovered is that instead of using the language of rights and invoking rights enshrined in Russian law and rights enshrined in international conventions like the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, many uh, local community members from indigenous peoples in the Arctic actually talked about benefits instead of rights and talked about themselves not as citizens of Russia but as local stakeholders right who would engage with a company on that basis and that was really surprising to us and it led us to a variety of questions one of which is how do local actors perceive the best ways to ensure the sustainability of their communities and their traditional practices in the Russian Arctic and subarctic and what is implied by the language of benefits rather than the language of rights? How does that shape outcomes? And if we think about benefits and a category of interaction called benefit sharing, which I'm going to tell you more about, what does that mean for empowering indigenous communities in the longer term, right? When is that a way that indigenous communities can gain more autonomy, more decision making, uh, greater ability to determine the su sustainability of their communities, and when does it just reproduce paternalistic practices of the past? So these are the questions I'm gonna explore, although I can't necessarily <laughs> promise to answer them, but we'll certainly explore them today, and then we'll leave lots of time for discussion and we can, we can talk about it in more detail. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the areas in which we did our research. Oh, I did that again. You guys can tell I'm a very technology wizard here. Okay, so um, the primary area I'm going to talk about today is the Nenets Autonomous Okrug, which is just right up here on the Barents Sea, um, just to the east of Arkhangelsk, and it's one of uh, Russia's foremo foremost oil producing regions. I'm also going to look at the region just to the south in the Komi Republic, where a group called the Komi Izhemsky live, Izhemsky live, and we'll talk about that. And then we're going to go over here to Sakhalin Island for a contrasting case. And then the most recent research, which we haven't actually published on yet, uh, was carried out by Maria and Sieta in Yam Yamalinets, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit, although it's not part of the, former, the formal presentation today. Okay, so when we talk about indigenous peoples of the Russian Arctic and subarctic, we're thinking about the groups that are legally categorized in Russia as indigenous, small-numbered peoples of the North, Siberia, and the Far East. So this category includes 65 different groups of people, and they have to number 50,000 or less in order to fall into this category. So it's a pretty small group of people total, maybe only 300,000 people across all of Russia. 
these communities were designated in a, by a Russian law that passed in the year 2000. And a tricky thing about this law is that one of the ways in which these indigenous small number communities are identified is that they maintain a traditional way of life as a marker of their um, indigeneity. So that's an important factor. It's not enough just to be ethnically indigenous. You're supposed to have some percentage of your community still pursuing traditional ways of life. Um, so these are small groups, as I said. If we think about the Nenets Autonomous Okrug, um, we're talking about a region with a total population of only 48,000 people. Um, and of that, only about 7,500 are actually from the Nenets ethnic group. Um, and even a smaller number than that are still actively herding reindeer. The Komi Republic is larger. It's almost a million. And about a quarter of that population is the Komi ethnic group, but only a small number, approximately 15,000 individuals, are Komi Ijemsi, which are uh, Komi uh, uh, citizens who still pursue reindeer herding. And then in Sakhalin, we have very small numbers indeed. We have a number of indigenous communities, the Ulita, the Nanai, the Evenk, the Chukchi, um, the Itelmens, but only really about three to 5,000 total um, out of a total population of around half a million. So we are indeed talking about small numbers of people and communities that are quite endangered in terms of being able to maintain their traditional practice, practices and their identity. So I'm not gonna to spend too much time on the Soviet period, but many of you know that the indigenous peoples of Russia um, experienced a rather tumultuous time during the Soviet period, a period in which they, uh, uh, the state encouraged them to abandon their nomadic ways of life, to settle into state farms or collective farms, to no longer pursue shamanic religions, um, to develop written alphabets and to develop sort of recognizable culture in the Soviet eyes, and to send their children to internati or boarding schools um, while they engaged in the practice of reindeer herding. And so this was a very disruptive period. At the same time, the Soviet period also brought a lot of social infrastructure and the welfare state to these remote communities. So for many of these communities, it was the first time that they had a dom kulturi, it was the first time that they had a polyclinica, a post office, um, and also uh, a pension, right? Or other forms of, of welfare and subsidized food was another big uh, important part of the, the Soviet uh, way of maintaining these, these communities. As you can imagine, perestroika comes along, the economic collapse of the 1990s, much of the state support is withdrawn, and this is a devastating period for these communities, right, where the state basically kind of collapses out from under them in a disorganized fashion, and everything from fuel, electricity, um, subsidized flights and helicopter rides to food is lost in that period. So not too surprisingly, in the post-Soviet period, um, what happens is that uh, the oil and gas industry developed rapidly. It had existed in a small way in the Soviet period in the form of geological surveys that were sent out in the late 60s and the 1970s and the 80s to identify sites of, uh, for the potential of oil and gas extraction. But oil and gas extraction had barely begun during the Soviet period and it increased rapidly in the post-Soviet period. Um, uh, and as these indigenous companies struggled to, or these indigenous communities struggled to survive, they naturally looked to these enterprises as a source of support. Of course, in the Soviet era, era, whether it was the farm, the collective farm, or some other enterprise, often was a vehicle of social service provision for employees. Everything from a daycare center to vacation programs, right, to housing. And so we see that as Rosneft, Gazprom, Luke Oil, as well as Shell, Exxon, Total, Stat Oil, which now has this crazy name Equinor, I actually had to look it up, the Norwegian oil company, ConocoPhillips, and now increasingly China's National <coughs> Petroleum Company entered the region, they were besieged with requests for support from regional governments, local governments, and, and community members. Along with the globalization of the oil industry came the globalization of um, activism as well. So we see environmental organizations becoming active in this region, Greenpeace first and foremost. 
And we see other actors coming in and invoking things like the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights, like ILO Convention 169, um, and also financial actors that are lending money to the oil and gas companies that have their own rules and standards when it comes to working with communities and working with indigenous people. So for example, the International Finance Corporation has performance standards on environmental and social sustainability. The World Bank has an operational procedure for indigenous peoples, and the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development also has protocols for how to deal with communities and indigenous peoples. Okay. Many of these protocols have converged in practice <coughs> around something called benefit sharing. Benefit sharing is a kind of clunky, sort of poorly defined umbrella term for the idea that those industries that are benefiting from extraction uh, on the tr traditional territory of a given people should share the benefits of that extraction with those local community members. Now, benefit sharing first was codified at the international level as part of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it was initially geared more toward pharmaceutical companies working in the Amazon. Um, but the 2010 Nagoya Protocol, which is attached to the CBD, actually lays it out more broadly for all extractive industries, right? And so benefit sharing has become kind of a catchphrase globally and part of the corporate social responsibility policy of a lot of extractive industries. Now, benefit sharing can mean a whole host of things. And if you ask 10 people what benefit sharing is, you'll get 10 different answers. For some, it's simply um, ta paying your taxes, being a good citizen, following the law, maybe a production sharing agreement with the central government. But for many oil and gas companies operating in the Arctic, it includes socioeconomic agreements that are negotiated at different levels of government, whether that's the regional level, the district level, or small municipalities that include some kind of budget for supporting local infrastructure. Maybe that's roads, maybe that's schools, maybe it's a hospital. Um, and sometimes it's flashier things. You can imagine it's very popular to fund ice hockey arenas in this area, right? Everybody wants to have a glitzy ice palace, as they're <coughs> called, right? Um, there's also funding for more symbolic events, Olymp student Olympiads, um, celebrations of reindeer herders, holidays for veterans, holidays for pensioners, right? Um, and these are kind of semi-formal agreements, in some places guided by Russian law, in some places not. Um, and they also are supplemented with charitable giving and with direct negotiation with reindeer her herders at times, which we'll talk about. There also is a separate category, which some people include under benefit sharing, which is compensation for damages done to the land and revenue loss from reindeer herding. This is a controversial category, and we can talk a little bit more about it later. Through the course of our research, we kind of developed four ideal types of benefit sharing um, that we see uh, in Russia, although we don't see the fourth one in Russia. The one that we see most commonly, we call the paternalistic <laughs> mode of benefit sharing. And that's basically where companies work with the state to sort of decide what kind of support they want to give to communities. Um, and the negotiation happens mostly behind closed doors and often includes the gift of in-kind goods. We will build you X. We will give you firewood. We will give you fuel, right? The corporate social responsibility mode is a little bit different. It's usually guided not so much by um, the traditions of the past, of so, uh, Soviet provision of welfare, but instead by whatever the corporate office says the corporate social responsibility should be, um, and, and then negotiating that and finessing it with the local conditions. Third is the partnership mode, and this is unusual for Russia, but does exist, where you have these tripartite agreements between the state, the company, and local communities, and we're going to see that on Sakhalin Island. And the fourth is the shareholder mode, and that's something that we see very clearly in Alaska, but we actually don't really see in Russia, where residents um, or indigenous community members actually receive direct dividends from oil extraction by being part of a group that actually owns, owns the resources. So in Russia, the paternalistic is the most common, but we'll talk a little bit about corporate social responsibility and partnership. <coughs> 
All right, I'm gonna introduce you to my three cases. I'm not gonna be super systematic about it. I figure we'll have time in the Q&A to talk about it more, and I am very aware that I can go on endlessly about these cases, so I'm gonna try to be a little bit brief. And I'll speak uh, mostly at first about the Nenets Autonomous Okrug, which is the place where I personally have spent the most time, um, and a place that I think is really, is really fascinating. Okay. So the Nenets Autonomous Okrug, and you can see um, you know, from these images exactly how closely together you sometimes get the practice of reindeer herding and the practice of extraction. Um, it's a region where reindeer herding is still very actively pursued, and what happens is that people um, who live more toward the southern regions or um, the western regions of the province herd their reindeer up to the Barents Sea in the summertime and then herd them back again through the fall where they can be slaughtered in their home village. And the interesting thing about this uh, region, Nenets, is that it was one of the first to develop its own regional laws to try to protect indigenous rights. So immediately in the perestroika era, there was mobilization on the part of in the indigenous community. The regional government thought, uh-oh, here we've got trouble in our hands. We need to pacify this. And it actually was a very constructive period in the late 1990s where they passed a number of laws that, um, uh, that, that endorsed indigenous people's rights to territory, their right to compensation, et cetera, et cetera. And they did this uh, with the help of an NGO called Yasa Ve, which is the leading uh, indigenous NGO in Nenets. Um, and so this led to kind of a moderation of the conditions in, in Nenets, and it led to more substantial benefit sharing earlier in this republic than anywhere else that we've seen in Russia. But in some ways, it also led to a practice that very closely replicates the Soviet model of <coughs> welfare provision, okay? So in this system, the state plays the dominant role, and they negotiate with oil, oil and gas companies individually, depending on how long they've been in the region, how much oil they're producing, and how vulnerable they are to state pressure. Um, and they emerge from be these closed door meetings and say, okay, here's what we have agreed. This much in cash for the budget, this much for an eth eth uh, ethnic museum, this much for schools in this area. And so it's a very paternalistic form of benefit sharing, which really doesn't la allow the indigenous peoples themselves to kind of get into the process and um, state what their preferences are, what their priorities are, right? So um, it's generous, but in some ways it's disempowering. And you can see that there's a lot to object to. Um, what tends to happen is that actually the tundra environment is very fragile. Um, it's very wet, it's very swampy, the plants are very slow growing, and it's very easy to disrupt um, that uh, land and turn it into basically an unusable sort of mud patch. In fact, in most of these places, you can't drive anywhere during the summer months. You have to take a helicopter. You can, there's a winter road, and often one of the, the benefits that companies provide is that they maintain the winter road. Of course, they're using it for their own purposes as well, but in the summer, aside from the herders, most people choose to get around by helicopter if they can, if they can afford it. These are images from the Yasave um, NGO organization. Um, now, in some cases, we see that actually municipalities are able to conclude their own agreements with oil and gas companies. So we spent some time in a village called Horiver, and they were uh, relatively close, just a 20-minute helicopter ride away from a big uh, oil and gas installation called the Ardalan installation um, that was run by ConocoPhillips and uh, Luke Oil together. And um, this, uh, this um, oil and gas station had been the target of requests by local communities because they felt that this, the pipelines coming from this uh, in installation were blocking the paths for the reindeer herders and that they had to go well around the paths and that also they were getting air pollution from the gas flaring. Now, um, at first, the interactions between uh, this installation and local villagers were pretty informal. For example, it's, we interviewed people and we said, 
you know, have you um, had any interaction with the workers from this company? Um, do you know anything about benefit sharing? And one reindeer herder told us in all sincerity, well, once my dog was limping and I was able to leave my dog there for several months and they, they, they fed my dog, right? So there was some sort of very informal, and people started visiting the site also to get, receive medical attention when they were out in the fields. But eventually, after months of negotiation, ConocoPhillips agreed to build a new school in the village of Horever. And so you can see within this kind of village of wooden structures, um, very proximate to the, the river here, there stands out this sort of yellow and red building, which is a school building that they built. And for that reason, Horever was considered one of the most successful examples of, of benefit sharing in the region. And when you ask people why is it they were so successful, they said they have a strong mayor. As all things in, in the former Soviet Union, it's personal connections that do, that do the trick. Okay, let's look at a contrasting case and think about it a little bit. Let's look at the Republic of Komi. So interestingly, in the northern, in the northeastern part of the Republic of Komi, there's also a group of reindeer herders. We talked about them, the Komi Jemsi. And they actually herd their reindeer across uh, the Nenets region up to the Barents Sea as well. But the Komi Jemsi have a problem. And their problem is they have not been recognized domestically <coughs> as indigenous small numbered people of the north. The reason they haven't is because they have the misfortune of having a population that straddles four federal units. And they have to receive the support of the government of all four federal units in order to be designated. And they only have received the support of the Komi government so far. So they need Nenets, Yamala Nenets, and Arhangelsk in order to get, in order to get this recognition. So the Komi Jemsi are interesting because they are in a region where Luke Oil dominates. And Luke Oil um, has had a, a very murky track record in this region. I'm not sure exactly why that is, if it's just because the facilities are older. It's one of the earlier sites of oil extraction. But they have a tremendous number of leaks. So for example, we were interviewing representatives from Luke Oil, and we showed them a 2014 Greenpeace-sponsored report that said just in the region around the city of Usinsk, there had been more than 200 oil spills uh, detected in the last year. And the representative from Luke Oil said, no, 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 that's outrageous, that's outrageous, let me find our report. <coughs> and he found his report, and their report, report confirmed that there had only been 67 uh, oil spills in the region. So still, still an enormous number of oil spills. Um, so people in this region would like compensation, but one of the things that Luke Oil indicated to them is, listen, you know, you're not really indigenous people. We don't really have any special um, protocol for, for supporting you, for compensating you for reindeer herding. And so what the Komi Jemsi did, which was very interesting, is that they, through an organization called Izviatis, and another group called the Save the Pechora Committee, collaborated with Greenpeace and others to push themselves into indigenous forums at the global level. So they started going to the Arctic Council, they started going to the UN, they started writing letters and petitions to other well-known international indigenous groups, and they gained sort of international recognition. Um, and they did this also through RIPON. For, they had the good fortune that right around this time they were doing this in the late 2000s, Luke Oil took a big loan from the EBRD. And the EBRD has rather strict requirements for how you engage with indigenous peoples. Now, the trick is the loan wasn't for activity in the Komi Republic, it was actually for develop, development in Yamal and the Nets. But they were able to use this to publicize their plight, um, and they issued a 10 point um, statement of demands for Luke Oil about uh, environmental protection and indigenous rights. And they publicized this broadly internationally. They reached out to Luke Oil shareholders, they reached out to the EBRD, and they hosted a number of local protests, right? So the EBRD loan, Luke Oil had promised to both anticipate and avoid adverse impacts on projects on the lives and livelihoods of indigenous peoples, right? Luke Oil eventually did decide in 2015 that they would negotiate uh, a socioeconomic agreement with the Komi Jemsi, even though they didn't believe they were required to. 
but they agreed only to meet the demands on the 10-point list that had to do with indigenous rights and none of the environmental demands. And in that way, they tried to split this kind of alliance that had existed between indigenous groups and environmental groups. So that's a model where you don't work through the regional legislation, you don't count on the regional government to help you, you reach out to the global level. Okay, one more quick example. Oh, and I think I passed by, did I pass by a picture? Oh no, I didn't have it, there we go. Okay, the last example is Sakhalin. Now Sakhalin is a famous example in Russia, and if you've ever you know, heard of any of these cases, this is probably the one that you've heard about. And that's because um, Sakhalin is a premier oil and gas development in Russia that was developed under the auspices of Shell um, and Sakhalin Energy, which Shell used to be the majority stakeholder, now it's Gazprom is the majority stakeholder. And that's Sakhalin 2 and Sakhalin 1, which is led by Exxon. And what happened is that this region is quite fragile in ways that are of great interest to the international uh, environmental community. Partly because of the Pacific gray whale population, partly because of Pacific salmon habitat. And so as these installations were being constructed, there was kind of a flood of environmental interest and activism into the region. And they once again formed an alliance with indigenous peoples, and they engaged in something called the Green Wave Movement, which went on roughly from 2005, 2006. And what's interesting about this is that the Sakhalin uh, 2, which was led by Shell, needed a lot of financing. And they were at that very moment globally seeking international financing. And the project appeared to be somewhat threatened by these green wave protests. And so what they did is they sort of bent over backwards to do a kind of best practices in engagement with Arctic communities. And they developed something called um, the, um, I want to be sure to get the name right, here I've got it on the next side, the Sakhalin Indigenous, Indigenous Minorities Development Plan. And this is the most formal example of benefit sharing that you'll see in Russia to this point. It was a model in which you would have equal representation from the state, the company, and the indigenous community, and that there would be oversight uh, by indigenous community members of how much the level of, of, uh, of benefits transferred and also the type and how they were used. They were supposed to be used in two categories, so a social development fund and an economic development fund. And community members could apply um, museums could apply, schools could apply, individuals could apply, family members could apply, either to design some kind of business venture or to und undertake some effort to maintain sort of cultural practices. So this was seen as a really impressive form of um, benefit sharing, and it got written up. This is a page from the UN Global Compact. It was sort of written up everywhere, it won all of these awards. It was phenomenal. Of course, if you followed this issue at all, you know that behind the scenes, actually, uh, Shell um, and Sakhalin Energy got pushed out by the Russian state on the pretext of not doing enough for the environment or indigenous peoples, which there's merit and, and also it was a little bit strategic. Um, and now Gazprom has the, um, the, the majority stake. And what's happened is that although it still exists, we're in our <laughs> third, um, we're in the third, uh, Sakhalin Indigenous Minorities Development Plan period right now. Many people argue that it's become much more formal and that there's quite a bit of infighting, but it still remains kind of the gold standard for the region. So I, you know, we're kind of writing these up sort of by cases and in comparisons, but I just want to give you, you know, a couple of things that you've probably heard already that seem to shape the level and the type of benefits that actually get shared in Russia. One of them, of course, is whether you are recognized as an indigenous group at all in Russia. And it's not just the Komi Jemsi who don't have this, uh, who don't have recognition. There's another group called the, the Pamor in, um, near um, the White Sea who are in the same dilemma. But that's, that's one of the issues. The other is, what did the region do? Regions, actually, we think of Russia as this very homogenous, very centralized place, and of course, in some ways it is. But still, in the 1990s and early 2000s, there was a lot of regional diversity, and there remains a lot of variation on laws on the books having to do with indigenous peoples at the regional level. So are you able to actually use, make use of those laws? Another issue, which I haven't really mentioned here, but which is essential, but very complicated, is what is your relationship to the land that you use? 
are you just using it traditionally as you always have, or do you actually have a lease to that land? Is that land designated as agricultural land, or has it been designated as industrial land? Are you a private reindeer herder, or are you from a collective farm or an enterprise? All of those things matter, the degree to which you actually have a say over what happens on that land. Then, of course, in some places we see movements that are robust and long-lasting. In other places we see relatively shorter movements, either because they were successful or, for other reasons, they were circumvented. And then we see that companies can be more or less vulnerable. They're very vulnerable at the moment when they're seeking financing, if it's international financing. They're also vulnerable depending on who their shareholders are, right? So if you are a majority owned by the Russian government, you are a little more resilient to some of these claims than if you are a multinational. Um, and we're interested in exploring this more and systematizing it more. Uh, corporate uh, social responsibility policies matter as well. Um, and so does reputational <laughs> considerations. But throughout this, what's very interesting and doesn't come up in the benefit sharing literature often is the way in which the state has maintained a pretty significant role in how benefit sharing works and what actually is negotiated. And one of the things that I think is fascinating about this process is how regional governments have found a way to pay for some of the very expensive welfare provisions in these regions through benefit sharing and actually burnish their own popularity in some cases by being able to deliver goods through their negotiations with these corporate actors. Um, but this still leaves a lot of open questions. So one of the things that we kind of reflect upon a little bit about what does it mean to mobilize, mobilize on the basis of rights, uh, of rights that are endowed to you, inalienable human rights, um, from international codified in international conventions and domestic law versus the rights you might have as a stakeholder, right? What's the difference between rights and benefits and how does that change the way that you mobilize? I have to say, we didn't go into this project especially interested in benefit sharing. It was kind of the language that was on the ground and the way that people were, were mobilizing on the ground. Um, but benefit sharing is limited, especially in the absence of a robust enforcement of indigenous rights. If you don't really control your territory, then you actually can't block industrial activity and you can only try to sort of extract some value out of that industrial activity. And in general, indigenous groups in Russia are not seen as having any special claims. So, for example, a 2004 International Working Group for Indigenous Affairs report that was one of the best done um, kind of global studies of indigenous rights in Russia said, in Russia, indigenous people's rights are considered something which is granted by the state and revoked when needed. So for that reason, things like free prior and, yeah, prior and informed consent don't actually work very well in Russia, even though they're the ideal of benefit sharing. Um, the other thing that's happening is space for mobilization is contracting in a variety of ways. You can see this most obviously in the Comey case, but it's visible in all of the cases. So I mentioned in Nenets that there was an NGO called Yasave. They maintain great relations with the regional government, but their youth, youth wing, which was called um, Yasave Mansara, was a little bit more radical, a little bit more energetic, a little bit more vocal, and they were declared a foreign agent. In the Sakhalin case, we saw that long-term alliance between indigenous groups and environmental groups, and on the Russian side, um, Sakhalin Environmental Watch was the major organization. They, too, were declared a foreign agent at one point, although I think they've been able to shed that status. And then in Komi Ejemsi, we see it even more dramatically. Uh, the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North, RAIPAN, was the group that helped them get to the Arctic Council. For that offense and many others, RAIPAN was um, taken over and reorganized and restaffed by the Russian government. Um, and many of its former leaders had their individual NGOs in their home regions declared foreign agents as well. So we see all sorts of challenges to continued mobilization. Um, but in the end, I think we can see that this shift from the language of rights to benefits from citizenship or self-determining indigenous peoples to stakeholders has been strategic. 
it's been rather effective in Russia's sort of less than democratic context. And it's led to some interesting uh, outcomes in the short term that truly have benefited individual communities. But the state continues to play that decisive role, asserting its authority over the level and type of benefits. And not all benefit sharing, sharing uh, agreements are created equal. One of the things that we found is that even in neighboring villages, people had no idea how the amount that they were receiving compared to any other place in the region. They had no idea how that amount had been arrived at, and they had no idea if that same amount would be available the next year. So there's a tremendous risk when benefit sharing is, involved, is, is uh, granted in this paternalistic fashion. And one of the reasons that the Sakhalin case is so celebrated is, is because when we think about equity, we can think about it along two axes. We can think about distributional equity. How should we distribute the benefits of extraction for communities that live in the region? Right? And you can see greater or lesser levels of, of equity in the distribution of resources. Um, but you can also think about procedural equity. How is it decided? Right? Who, is, who has a seat at the table? Who gets to contribute to this form of governance? And actually, if you talk to people at the global level, they have kind of an ideal that if you really had robust equity and benefit sharing that was distributional and procedural, that you actually could create these pockets, a sort of more liberalized space, where you could carve out de facto indigenous rights, even if de jure they're not very robust, right? But in fact, we see that procedural equity is still underdeveloped, even as distributional equity has developed. So we see very rarely do indigenous peoples actually have a seat at the table. And of course, there's another irony to all of this, which I'm sure you've put your finger on already, which is that benefit sharing has this unintended consequence of tying the future of many of these communities closely to the activity that actually ultimately sort of threatens their long-term survival. And a leader, a village leader in Sakhalin who works closely with Exxon, Exxon Nefty Gas Limited, expressed this ambivalence. She said, you all know that we have been already pressed by civilization on all sides. We are dislodged here. And if we lose all this de development, all this exploitation, we'll lose the source of our money. Right? And so we heard this again and again, the sense of that simultaneously uh, culture is being eroded, but the only path to cultural survival is actually to continue to receive funding from these companies. Um, so I think really actually many communities are now kind of coming to the recognition that along with benefits, they might need to think more about rights again. And we see some movement in the Arctic Council and some other places to focus again on the practical meaning of indigenous uh, rights and what it means in relation with the extractive industries. And so that's something we'll be keeping our eyes on in future iterations of this project. Thank you very much. I told you I could go on and on. Sorry about that. No. Questions? Yeah, I see back there. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. Um, Here's the mic. Hi, thanks so much for the talk. I was wondering if you hear a lot about climate change and benefits sharing and communities yeah. and dealing with the oil industry, because I'm sure that area just like Alaska is going to get hammered by it. Yeah, it's absolutely the case that um, climate change coinciding with all these other changes just adds to the complexity of issues on the ground because the freezes come later in the year, um, and so it's harder to harvest, uh, to, to sort of butcher the reindeer. Um, you're developing these giant sinkholes and lakes where none were before, so it's harder actually to move the reindeer around in these traditional paths. Um, but you know, it's funny, you don't hear much about it unless you introduce it as a topic. At least that was my experience, sort of, up through 2015, I think 2017, I heard a little bit more about it. Um, and when people talk about it, they don't talk about it in the sense of kind of the Western scientific sense of climate change or the responsibility of the oil and gas companies for climate change. They talk a lot about um, 
individual things, the mosquitoes, the fish, the birds, the land. And depending on the region, they might have different interpretations of why, that, why these things are happening. But um, kind of the language of climate change hasn't really yet become a robust part of the ways these communities engage with the corporations or the state, at least that I have seen to this point. But it's a great question. Yeah. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, yes, my question. Um, so are there actually either regional or federal protections <coughs> for the environment? I mean, are there like guidelines that mm -hmm. those companies, and minimal guidelines that they need to follow? Because some of the photos you showed are like really terrible yeah. uh, and worrisome. That's one question. And the other question I had was um, in terms of the population of these areas, is there like a, a you know an out migration, for example, of young people, mm -hmm. or what's the suicide rate? I mean, I know in Canada, for example, for for p native communities in that region, it's it's rates of alcoholism, drug abuse, suicide is very very high, um, and migration to urban centers outside of the region. So, I mean, this also can contribute to being more dependent mm -hmm. on subsidies from companies in order to keep a, some kind of cultural survival if the young are leaving because of difficult conditions. So I was wondering if yeah. you could say a few words of how, how these things might may be related to each other. Yeah, great questions. I mean, the interesting thing about Russia is it actually has quite an impressive body of environmental law. Um, in some cases, what Russians say, the normative acts, the actual kind of implementing laws haven't been created. But even for many issues, there are implementing laws. The problem is enforcement and oversight, by and large. So in the Komi-Jemsi region, um, people often told us that they would report spills, um, we frequently report spills um, to Rostechnadzor, um, uh, Rosprirodnadzor, the oversight, the Environmental Oversight Committee. And um, what companies would do is they would detonate these mini explosions near the site of a spill that would turn the soil over so that the oil wasn't visible. And that it was so expensive to get to these far-flung regions that the bureaucracy wouldn't pay for it themselves. They would rely on the company to provide them helicopter services for the period they were in the region to go and see these various locations. So they felt that there was very little oversight in practice and that when there were fines, the fines were very modest. And the interesting thing is that, you know, a lot of the interviewees express this ambivalence, like they are proud to be part of the oil and gas producing regions of Russia, the great might and strength of Russia. And they didn't want, they often didn't want these companies closed down entirely, but they did want better oversight. So that's a great question. In terms of the state of the communities in general, I mean, the 1990s were a real low, and a lot of people left and went to the cities and didn't feel as though they could, they could continue to pursue traditional way of life. And some people, some people came back, and there's a bit of a revival of reindeer herding. But as you say, problems with alcoholism in particular are endemic. We spent quite a while in a village called Nelmenos, which had maybe 1,200 residents. And elder, several elderly people told us that when their pensions came to the post office, they either had to go as a group or they had to go in the middle of the day because they had been robbed so many times and they knew the people who were robbing them and they were alcoholics and they were just desperate, right, for funding. So, so it's, it's that kind of tragic situation that you see, um, you see in many <coughs> northern communities, which is, is very sad, but there's a surprising amount of um, there's a surprising amount of determination to revive these communities. I think by the time we got there, they had kind of hit the sort of bottom and were, were coming back up. Um, and some exchange between the cities and the um, villages. So we met um, university students in Naryanmar, which is the capital of the Nenets Autonomous Okrug, um, students who are going back and forth very purposefully to spend part of the year with their families herding reindeer so that they would have those skills. But yeah, there are lots of problems beyond the oil and gas development, certainly. Yeah. Hi, Josh. Well, thank yeah. you for your talk. Um, I wondered if you could just give us your sense of uh, Dec the declaration of many NGOs as foreign agents and whether that's simmered down do you think that were 
kind of out of that period of th three or four years ago when it was extremely prevalent. <laughs> yes. And I think like Pavel Salunziga is now in Maine camping out. Yeah, I see out, him right? quite often actually. Because he's exiled. So really tried to kind of gutted a lot of the yeah. key figures in the environmental movement in Russia. And whether you think that that's calming down, whether you see any shifts um, in yeah. that strategy yeah. to disable indigenous rights and environmental you know, issues and things. So this law on foreign agents is a 2012 law that the Russian government passed where any NGO that was receiving foreign funding and engaged in political activities could be designated a foreign agent and would have to pay a fine and have to use its foreign agent status prominently on its web page and all of its publications and any, any public events. And there was a real flood because kind of 2014, 2016, through 2016 into 2017 of putting people on the foreign agent, putting organizations on the foreign agent list. First at the federal level, they, the Ministry of Justice picked a lot of groups that they had found especially frustrating and then the regional governments were empowered to select foreign agents as well. And I think if you just look at the sheer numbers, it has slowed down dramatically. Partly because NGOs have, have realized ways to manage their risk and to get around the law partly because it attracted so much international censure. Um, and actually, some groups were able, if not successfully able to fight the law in court, they were, over a period of several years, successfully able to get taken off of the registry. So it's not as common, but it has had that effect that many laws in Russia do when they are used um, selectively and kind of unpredictably, uh, it sort of uh, makes everybody cautious and causes a sort of rolling back of activities that you're worried could provoke government interest in what you're doing. So I think it's had a sort of chilling effect and it continues to have a chilling effect, but I think as a tool, um, we're definitely seeing a lessening of the use of the foreign agent law. But as you said, so Josh mentioned um, Pavel Solonziga, who is the vice president of the RAIPAN, the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples of the North. He was pushed out of the organization. His own NGO that represents the Udige people of Primorsky <laughs> Krai was declared a foreign agent. He was accused of ethnic separatism, and he is now in, has sought political asylum in the United States. Um, and just happens to live in Maine, not very far from me, so we see each other a lot. This is well after I started this project, just one of those coincidences of like, was he here last fall? Yeah, he's a great guy. So um, yeah, so I think, but I think it had, it's had its, its effect, right? And for regional governments, why would you work with a foreign agent for them, you know, why would you risk it, right? And so the Norwegians who are quite active in that region have found it challenging to continue some of the work that they were doing, although they persist, right? People are creative. Russians especially know how to get around the letter of the law. And so I can tell you the strategies, the hair-raising strategies people have told me to how they continue their activism, which I would never write down for fear of getting them in trouble. But, but there, there's still a lot of work going on despite the foreign agent law. Great question. Hi, when, uh, when I uh, hear the term benefits, I think of costs. What, uh, uh, do you have a sense of um, how much of the profits uh, from the oil and gas uh, goes to benefits? That's do, you a have a, do you have a sense of how profitable <laughs> operating in these areas are and the cost in, of the environment and all these other things. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it sounds like that would be a whole lecture, you know. Yeah, it's such a good question. I can't tell you how many times we sat down to try to be systematic about this and figure it out, but the, the financing of these companies is very opaque and the profits are very <coughs> opaque as well. If you talk to them, they'll say, oh no, we're not making any money. It's so expensive to operate here. All of, we're investing in infrastructure where there's no profit whatsoever. Um, but of course, when Russia's export, you know, now account for like 14% of Russian GDP is the export of oil and gas. So we know that it's an enorm enormous sums of money overall, right? And the benefit sharing agreements also, people were very reluctant to acknowledge, you know, often when they were given in kind, people had no idea how much it had cost to build that school or how much it had cost to maintain the winter road. 
When it was at the district level, people would sometimes venture that it was, you know, 100,000, maybe up to 500,000, but relatively small sums of money at the district and, and lower level. And we couldn't get estimates at the regional level, by and large, but very, very small sums of money um, overall. I think it's, it's a real, if it preempts activism, if it preempts reputational damage, I think it's a, a very modest investment by the companies for, for the return that they're gaining. In terms of overall cost, you know, it's really, it's really difficult to know. We had that question about climate change earlier, and there's such an ambivalence in Russia about climate change, right? This idea that the northern sea route is going to be open and going to be usable, you know, and that Russia is going to be this, you know, most important global trading route for China to Europe and North America. <coughs> Um, is such is so deeply embedded in the conversation that you know climate change is kind of taken for granted, um, and there are a lot of pluses as well as minuses that are seen. But but one of the things that's changed from the time that we did our initial research is that there's a new process at the federal level for it's called an ethnological and ecological um, assessment, and indigenous communities can do these assessments and they can um, apply for, there's a damage calculator that they can use. So when it used to be sort of complaints and then you know charitable giving by the company, this has formalized that a little bit and they're actually getting more money now, but they have to invest in doing the assessments first before they actually get the money. So we talked to many people who were interested in doing an assessment but didn't feel that they could afford to do one in their particular region. Um, and that's only if you have a lease. That only works if you actually have some kind of formal lease to the territory that you're using. So great question about costs, enormous, but we really don't have a good handle on it. Hi, thanks for your talk, fascinating. Um, two questions, um, one is, Something I just I just don't know. Maybe it's a simple answer, but um, the foreign companies coming in um, are they do they have to employ only Russians or mm. do they bring in any of their own um, you know outsiders into yeah. the community to work in the mines or the gas fields and that sort of thing? Uh, so how much of that or not? And well, is Russia part of the question is is Russia different from other places in the world where we're having a lot of foreign investment but they bring in their own people? Um, yeah, they mm -hmm. mostly bring in their own people. So mm -hmm. there, we saw two different types of workers. So Gazprom, Rosneft, Luke Oil bring in a lot of workers from other parts of Russia, and they fly them in for two weeks on, two weeks off, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes longer periods on, longer periods off. Even the woman, woman working in the cafeteria was actually from southern Russia. When we visited the installation, she wasn't from the region. So there are no jobs for local people out of this. And then we met this interesting group of managers. So for when there's a multinational consortium, the multinational par partners often insist that the managers have to be flown out for management training. So when we visited Ardalan, we got off the helicopter, and there was the Russian manager there, and he was saying, you know, welcome, welcome. And then in English, he says to me, safety first. And that was his sort of main thing. He'd been in Houston for six weeks and getting his, his training there. So they have some, you know, kind of melange of, but, but really no, no, I didn't hear, except in the capital cities occasionally, I never heard of anybody from the local communities being employed by these companies. Is that, is that a source of tension with the local people or do they not want to be involved? No, no, they complain about it for okay. sure. I mean, um, because the, the wages are very high. Yeah. Or, and, and, and you know, often people aren't really sure what the wages are, but they're reputed to be very high. And I'm, I'm sure they, they are significantly higher than, than what you can make in the local community. So it's a source, it's not the number one source of tension, but in focus groups it always came up. Sooner or later, somebody always mentioned they don't even hire us. Yeah. Um, one different question then is um, going back to the photos that you showed about the infrastructure, the, the, the mines, the gas fields, et cetera. So um, are these fairly localized, or do you, do you find them growing and spreading? And what do you think as far as their impact on the landscape? Um, are the indigenous communities, the reindeer herders, able to work around them reasonably well? Mm. Is their landscape eventually at risk of, um, if there's enough uh, of the operations plus all the infrastructure that comes along with them, is there a risk that um, the landscape will get transformed enough that it will make them difficult for their way of life. 
Uh, yeah, that is a great question. Yeah. And you see this most, and then it's because it's a more spread out space and the oil field is bigger. When they first started building the infrastructure to extract oil and gas in the region, there was a conversation about pipeline sharing. And there was an initial negotiation between a couple of big consortia, like could they possibly you know, build their own pipelines and then share a big pipeline. And the agreement fell apart. Partly they were all at different stages, they all had different types of financing. So what happened is the proliferation of pipelines in the region. So there are some areas in which there will be kind of, within several kilometers, eight pipelines that run roughly parallel to each other. And a requirement of the regional government is that either your pipeline has to be high enough that reindeer can go under it, or you have to build a kind of a bridge sort of thing for um, people to go, for reindeer to go over. I've, I never saw one of those bridges. I, on, I only saw where you could go under. But they are not coordinated. And actually, there, I could never found a map. Like, I, I asked this Yasave, the NGO, like, do you have a, a map of where the crossings are? And they said, no, but we get reports. So, you know, they're thinking of making a map at that time. So you can you know, wander along the pipeline looking for one of these ventures. And as you see, there's areas of real swampy ground that you kind of have to go around. So people, people were very concerned about that. And, and, and there's also some other things going on, which, which uh, so from the perspective of the herders, land is being withdrawn from pasture, what they call it just as more and more of these facilities always have kind of a, they always have kind of an area of, of, of damage around them. And um, it just means that more and more territories aren't available for foraging for the animals. And so that can make the trip up to the Bar Barents Sea quite unpredictable, people reported to us. I never, I never made that trip. Maria actually flew out to meet them at the end of the, the journey. They have a big meeting. Um, She's done that a couple of times, but I, I've never made it to that. So, but that was how, what people reported. <coughs> Any more questions? I missed the first 10 minutes. How did you get into this? What, you know, yeah. how did you, you went to university somewhere. How, what, how did you? Well, I, I, I'm actually a little bit sheepish about this because uh, I, I think it's a, it's a rare privilege and a great responsibility to work with indigenous peoples. And I actually, I, I came into this because I've worked on environmental politics in Russia for really since the early 1990s, first just as a volunteer person working in NGOs in Russia and then going back and doing my dissertation on post-Soviet activism and doing five Russian regions and comparing environmental activism in those, in those regions. None of them were the regions that you looked at here, actually. Those were all different regions. And um, what happened is I, as, as the Putin regime had this chilling effect on environmental <coughs> activism overall, I became more and more interested in the way in which global agreements tried to intervene and supplement state governance with other forms of governance. So I got into this project actually by studying forest communities, only a few of which were indigenous, and the way in which the Forest Stewardship Council, if you're gonna certify your products as sustainable, has these elaborate requirements for community engagement. And I was trying to see if these, if these requirements were actually implemented and how people used them. And as I was doing this work on forestry from roughly 2007 until about 2014, <coughs> Um, got this idea that actually these issues were heightened in oil and gas communities because the global governance was less robust. So we, we went in to look at that, and at first we looked mostly at Russian communities, but they were not as much on the front lines. So the communities we looked at were either mixed or almost solely indigenous because that's where global governance really <laughs> seems to have leverage um, over the actions of the companies. Um, is in the protection of indigenous indigenous rights. So yeah, I kind of like maybe half wandered into it backwards and then, um, but it's been absolutely fascinating and a really rare privilege. The truth of the matter is, and now this is just between the 25 of us, I, I probably can't really do this work anymore actually. So I, um, I, I think that having a, an American in these regions has gotten to be 
almost impossible. I'm going to our Congo in June, and I'm going to try to get back to Nenets Autonomous Republic, but I've talked to some other people there, and they've said that word has gone around town that uh, within hours of their arrival, and nobody will meet with them. And these are some people from Scandinavia who've worked there for many, many years, and I can only imagine as an American it's more difficult. And when Maria and Sieta continued the project, um, Maria said, to, you know, it's actually easier without you because fewer people ask us if we're foreign agents. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, well, great, that's good. But so I, it's, it's been a really interesting, but I, I do think this kind of research is getting really difficult, especially for a Western scholar. At the same time, Russian scholarship is just growing and becoming more globally engaged, and there are so many talented young Russian scholars. I'm just really excited to see what they do and the questions that they ask and the research that they ask in the future. And I really hope that there'll be some indigenous scholars as well. I mean, that is the true goal, is to really find partners and young people that you can cultivate to study their own communities. And um, there are people out there trying to do that work. Andre Petrov of the University of Northern Iowa is really trying to cultivate young indigenous scholars in Russia. Um, and so I'm really optimistic about the future in, in that sense. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.